Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. What follows here is a little bonus video I've made in which I'm going to read Parmenides' poem. The main source I used for this poem is down in the description and I've updated the language somewhat to get rid of things like the these and the thous, but I hope you enjoy this reading. The horses that carry me brought me as far as my heart desired. Then they brought me, speeding along, to the far-famed road of a goddess who herself guides the man of knowledge, onward through all things. Along this road I was born. Along this road the horses, wise indeed, bore me, hurrying the chariot along, and young girls guided my course. The axes in its box, set on fire by the heat, uttered the sound of a pipe, for it was driven on by the rolling wheels on either side. When the virgin daughters of the sun hurried to escort me to the light, leaving the realms of night, pushing aside with the hand the veil from their heads. There is the gate between the ways of day and night, lintel above it and stone threshold beneath, held in its place and high in air. It is fitted with great doors. The justice of retribution holds the keys that open and shut them. However, the young girls addressed it with mild words and found means to persuade her to thrust back quickly for them the fastened bolts from the doors. And the gates swinging free made the opening wide, turning in their sockets the bronze hinges well fastened with bolts and nails. Then through this the young girls kept horses and chariot straight on the high road. The goddess received me with kindness, and, taking my right hand in hers, she addressed me with these words. Young man, joined with immortal drivers, who has come with the horses that carry you, to your dwelling, hail. Since no accident has happened to you on this road, for it lies far outside the beaten tracks of man, but instead right and justice, it is necessary for you to learn all things, both the eternal nature of persuasive truth and man's opinions in which rests no true belief. But nevertheless, you must also learn these things, since it is necessary to judge accurately the things that rest on opinion, passing all things carefully in review. Come now, I will tell you, and do hear my words and listen to it. What are the only ways of enquiry? What leads to knowledge? The one way, assuming that being is, and that it is impossible for it not to be, is the trustworthy path, for truth attends it. The other, that not being is, and that it necessarily is, I call a wholly incredible cause. Since you cannot recognize not being, for this is impossible, nor could you speak of it, for thought and being are the same thing. It makes no difference to me at what point I begin, for I shall always come back again to this. It is necessary both to say and to think that being is, for it is possible that being is, and it is impossible that not being is. This is what I ask you to ponder. I restrain you from this first cause of investigation, and from that cause also, along which mortals, knowing nothing, wander aimlessly, since helplessness directs the roaming thoughts in their bosoms and they are born on death and likewise blind, amazed, headstrong races, they who consider being and not being as the same and not the same, and that all things follow a back-turning course. The things which are, not are, shall never prevail, she said, but you must restrain your mind from this course of investigation and don't let long-practiced habit lead you on this path, your eye careless your ear and tongue overpowered by noise. But do weigh the much contested refutation of these words which I have uttered. Only this single path is left to tell you about, namely, that being is. And on this path there are many proofs, and being is without beginning, and is indestructible. It is universal, existing alone, immovable and without end nor ever was it, nor will it be, since it now is, altogether 
one and continuous. Will you search for how it is generated? From what did it grow and how? I will not permit you to say or to think that it came from not being, for it is impossible to think or to say that not being is. What thing would then have stirred it into activity that it should arise from not being, later rather than earlier? So it is necessary that being either is absolutely or is not. Nor will the force of the argument permit that anything springs from being, except being itself. Therefore, justice does not slacken her feathers to permit generation or destruction, but holds being firm. The decision as to these things comes in at this point. Either being exists or it does not exist. It has been decided, in accordance with necessity, to leave the unthinkable, unspeakable path, as this is not the true path, but that the other path exists and is true. How then should being suffer destruction? How come into existence? If it came into existence, it is not being, nor will it be, if it ever is to come into existence. So its generation is extinguished, and its destruction is proved incredible. Nor is it subject to division, for it is all alike, nor is anything more in it so as to prevent its cohesion, nor anything less, but all is full of being. Therefore, the all is continuous, for being is contiguous to being. Further, it is unmoved, in the hold of great chains, without beginning or end, since generation and destruction have completely disappeared, and true belief has rejected them. It lies the same, abiding in the same state and by itself. Accordingly, it abides fixed in the same spot, for powerful necessity holds it in confining bonds which restrain it on all sides. Therefore, divine right does not permit being to have any end, but it is lacking in nothing, for if it lacked anything, it would lack everything. Nevertheless, behold steadfastly all absent things as present in your mind, for you cannot separate being in one place from contact with being in another place. It is not scattered here and there through the universe, nor is it compounded of parts. Therefore thinking, and that by reason of which thought exists, are one and the same thing, for you will not find thinking without the being from which it receives its name. Nor is there, nor will there be, anything apart from being, for fate has linked it together, so that it is a whole and immovable, wherefore all these things will be but a name. All these things which mortals determined in the belief that they were true, namely that things arise and perish, that they are and are not, that they change their position and vary in color. But since there is a final limit, it is perfected on every side, like the mass of a rounded sphere, equally distant from the center at every point. For it is necessary that it should neither be greater at all, nor less anywhere, since there is no not being which can prevent it from arriving at equality. Nor is being such that there may ever be more than what is in one part and less in another, since the whole is involatile, for it is equal on all sides. It abides in equality within its limits. At this point, I cease trustworthy discourse and the thought about truth. From here on, learn the opinions of mortals, hearing of the elusive order of my verses. Men have determined in their minds to name two principles, but one of these they should not name, and in so doing they have erred. They distinguish them as opposing in character, and give them each character and attributes, distinct from those of the other. On the one hand, there is the ethereal flame of fire, fine, rarefied, everywhere, identical with itself, and not identical with its opposite. And on the other hand, opposed to the first, is the second principle, flameless darkness, dense and heavy in character. Of these two principles I declare to you, every arrangement as it appears to men, so that no knowledge among mortals may surpass you. 
But since all things are called light and darkness, and the particular properties of these are predicated of one thing and another, everything is at the same time full of light and of obscure darkness, of both equally, since neither has anything in common with the other, and the smaller circles are filled with unmixed fire, and those next with them with darkness, into which their portion of light penetrates. In the midst of these is the divinity, who directs the course of all. For she controls the birth that people fear, and intercourse in every part of the universe, sending female to join with male, and again male to female. First of all the gods, she devised love. You must know the nature of the heavens and all signs that are in the sky, the destructive deeds of the pure, bright torch of the sun, and from where they came. And you must learn the wandering deeds of the round-eyed moon and its nature. You must know also the sky surrounding everything, from where it came, and how necessity took it and chained it, in order to determine the cause of the stars, how earth and sun and moon and common sky and the Milky Way of the heavens and highest Olympus and the burning power of the stars came to exist. The moon wanders about the earth, shining at night with borrowed light. She is always gazing earnestly towards the rays of the sun. For just as at any time a man has various complex organs inside himself, so too is the mind of man organized. For that which thinks is the same in each man and every man, namely the essence of the organs, and the element that is in excess is thought. Boys on the right, girls on the left. So, according to men's opinions, that these things arise, and so they are now, and from this state, when they shall reach maturity, shall they perish. For each of these men has determined a name and a distinguishing mark. When male and female mingle seed of Venus in the form of one, the excellence from the two different bloods, if it preserves harmony, fashioned a well-formed body. But if, when the seeds are mingled, the excellencies fight against each other and do not unite into one, they will distress the sex that is coming into existence, as the twofold seed is mingled in the body of the unfortunate woman. With this, there are fineness and heat, and light and softness and brightness, and with the dense are classed cold and darkness and hardness and weight. For these are separated, the ones on one side, the others on the other.